Welcome to this presentation for the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program. My name is Calvin Wong and I'm one of the physiotherapists that works with the program. Today we'll be talking about pelvic floor physiotherapy for bowel and bladder concerns. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that the PCSE program is largely funded by donors and wanted to take a second to thank all of those donors for their continued support of myself and my colleagues here at the program in providing services to um, men in BC who are recovering from prostate cancer. Prostate Cancer Support Care Program consists of eight modules that provide various uh, services for people undergoing prostate cancer treatment, which include education and treatment to support recovery. There are eight modules that cover various topics, and today we'll be speaking about physiotherapy for bowel and bladder concerns. An overview of what we'll be speaking about We'll talk about bladder control mechanisms, bowel control mechanisms, the effect of radiation treatment on bladder and bowels, the effect of prostatectomy on bladder control, pelvic floor contractions or Kegels, and options for managing urinary incontinence in day-to-day -day life and during sexual activity. So how does the urinary system work? At the top here, we have the kidneys that filter blood and send fluid or urine through the ureters down into the bladder. The bladder itself is covered by a muscle called the detrusor. As the bladder fills with urine, it stretches. And when it stretches to a certain extent, the brain receives a signal to pee. Now normally, the signal that the bladder sends depends on how full the bladder is. The more full the bladder, the stronger the signal. When we get this signal in our brain, we choose to go to the bathroom and pee. And normally this can be done without feeling anxious or feeling an urge or a rush to pee. We simply walk to the bathroom, get ready to go, and our brain gets a signal to start peeing. Our pelvic floor muscles relax and the bladder muscle contracts, which allows the stream to start. When we finish peeing, our muscles contract, the bladder sphincter contracts, and the bladder muscle, the wall of the bladder, relaxes and we enter storage mode again. Now, sometimes with radiation, the lining of the bladder and the urethra becomes irritated and can cause a bit of burning or possibly a bit of leakage that can last four to eight weeks, and this usually resolves. Frequency and urgency are also potential symptoms that can accompany radiation treatment, um, and there are medications that can help with this. Sometimes these side effects can last um, two to five years after radiation treatment, um, but that's not often the case. Sometimes we can eliminate bladder irritants, which can help with symptoms of urinary or um, bowel leakage or incontinence that are associated with radiation therapy. And so we recommend trying to eliminate caffeine and alcohol or any of the common bladder irritants seen in this list here uh, for about two weeks to see if there's any improvement in urinary symptoms. We then try to add back one at a time to see if symptoms return and progress from there. We also suggest increasing water or fluid intake and not limiting your fluids. By increasing your water or non-irritating fluids, uh, it can make the urine less of an irritant when it's passing out through the bladder and into the urethra and can help to manage symptoms. Urge management strategies that involve distraction as well as behavioral and self-regulation strategies can also help with settling down urinary urgency. And this is sometimes part of the work we do in clinic. So now we'll talk a bit about the bowel system. So as food enters the body through the mouth and then runs down through the esophagus, food moves into the stomach and the digestive enzymes begin to break down that food. Food then moves through the small intestines and then into the large intestines where the nutrients and liquids get absorbed. Once the nutrients and liquids are removed, the remaining contents move into the end of the colon and collects in the rectal ampulla. Once the rectal ampulla fills, we get a signal to the brain to have a bowel movement. Sitting just in front of the rectum here is the bladder. With external green radiation treatment, sometimes the local tissues in this area can get irritated. So because of this irritation, sometimes people experience looser watery stools, abdominal cramping, or increased urgency and diarrhea. So what can we do about this? We usually tell people to stop taking laxatives and fiber supplements and often to follow a low fiber diet. Avoiding bowel irritants like caffeine, spicy foods, greasy or fried foods and alcohol is also recommended. 
we tell people to continue to um, hydrate. So drinking eight or more cups of fluid per day and using urge management techniques can be helpful as well. Now there is an online resource here if you're interested in learning a little bit more about a low fiber diet that can be helpful for managing these bowel symptoms. The PCSE program also has a dietitian on staff who can help with figuring out what dietary options may be best for helping to manage stool quality. Now sometimes when we experience bowel or bladder urgency, it can be improved with certain strategies that are termed cognitive behavioral strategies. We can practice certain self-regulation methods like calm, silent, breathing in and out through the nostrils. This helps us regulate our nervous system and can reduce the urgent, anxious sensations associated with urinary urgency or bowel urgency. Distraction is another way to achieve this and can include things like reading a book, talking to a friend or listening to some music, anything to take your mind off of the urge and to keep your mind calm. The key to using any of these urge management strategies is to be consistent with the practice and to catch yourself when you become anxious and to stop yourself from getting worked up. Over time, this helps us better manage our bowel and bladder sensations. We can also use our pelvic floor muscles to tighten and relax to reduce the urge sensations. Sometimes when people have loose stools, it can irritate the skin and the sphincter tissue. Zinc oxide creams can be helpful to protect the healing tissues in this area, especially as we pass stool through the area. We want to apply a large amount of cream to the area and reapply after each bowel movement. We want the cream to be on during and between bowel movements for the best protection. It's best to gently wash the area with warm water and soap. Avoid rigorously wiping the area after voiding because this can further irritate the skin and the tissue. Instead, patting the area after having movement and gently wiping is better or using a bidet can also be helpful. So moving on from radiation and its effects on the bladder and bowel, now we're gonna talk about what happens after a prostatectomy. To review, normally the bladder is able to fill and hold urine well when we run, jump, cough, or sneeze without any leakage. This is because the internal sphincter, the sphincter that sits at the very bottom of the bladder, is working well and able to stay contracted and hold back urine no matter what we're doing. When we have a prostatectomy, as you can see here, the prostate sits closely uh, up against the base of the bladder. And depending on the size and the amount of tissue that needs to be removed during surgery, sometimes a portion of the sphincter, the exit hole here, is also removed. The inside sphincter is part of the automatic closure mechanism around the urethra. And when it's disrupted, it can reduce how effective that sphincter is at automatically holding back urine when we do things like standing up, bending over, lifting things up, coughing and sneezing. The reason why this happens is because when we put pressure on our bladder, when we do activities where we exert ourselves, the pressure of exertion can sometimes increase above the closing pressure around the bladder's opening or that healing sphincter on the inside. We then can sometimes experience some leakage and this is what we call stress incontinence. Now we just spoke about the muscles at the base of the bladder that are automatic muscles that help us to hold back urine. Our pelvic floor muscles sit below the bladder and the prostate and are still active and functional after prostatectomy. We can use these muscles by consciously contracting them to help hold back urine and to reduce urine leakage with intentional voluntary muscle contractions. Pelvic floor muscles can be exercised and these exercises can be practiced before and after prostatectomy. But we normally recommend that people wait until their catheter is removed uh, before starting the practice. So how do we turn on our pelvic floor muscles? Many different cues can be used to help us find our pelvic floor muscles and turn them on. There is no right or best cue, merely the cue that works best for you in finding the muscles that you'll need to hold back urine. An important part of this is that we want to avoid tensing so much that we also bring on our abdominal muscles, our inner thigh muscles, and buttock muscles. And we want to be able to continue to breathe um, and not hold our breath when we're trying to work with our pelvic floor muscles to turn them on. Often people will try cues like tightening around the anus, lifting or tightening the perineum, which is the area behind the testicles but in front of the anus, 
Um, sometimes people will think about um, stopping their stream or stopping voiding um, or lifting the testicles. When practicing pelvic floor exercises, it's important to choose a time when you can focus on the sensations of your muscles contracting and relaxing and have the privacy to visualize the muscles we are working on. Often, practicing at home while sitting or lying comfortably or while sitting on a toilet or standing in the shower are nice private places to be able to focus on these exercises without any distractions. Watching for things like a slight or subtle penile indrawing, um, the penis moving in towards the body slightly can be a sign of an effective pelvic floor contraction, but this doesn't happen for everybody and it's not required for a good contraction. Sometimes people will try different techniques to improve their ability to feel a pelvic floor contract. So an anal stretch can be used by placing hands on the buttocks and pulling apart slightly and then contracting the pelvic floor muscles in that area. Sometimes this can increase the sensation of the contraction and help you feel those muscles turn on. Anal contact with a, the pad of a finger or a gloved finger, if someone's helping you feel, can be used to feel puckering of the external anal sphincter, which can be a sign of a pelvic floor contraction as well. Sometimes we can also use two fingers, the pads of two fingers like this, um, placed behind the testicles but in front of the anus, along the midline of that area between your testicles and anus, um, to feel uh, a ropey band that will tense and become more full when a pelvic floor contraction is done. Now again, we wanna stay away from um, using other accessory muscles in the area that aren't uh, as effective at holding back urine. So we want to be able to complete our pelvic floor contractions without feeling our, our abdominals contract, our buttocks or inner thighs contract, um, or without holding our breath. Now, often the question we get in clinic uh, when people arrive is uh, that people aren't sure whether or not they are using their pelvic floor muscles correctly or whether or not they're finding their pelvic floor muscles well. And so uh, at the PCSC program, we have uh, several types of biofeedback devices that can help us uh, determine the extent to which you're doing your exercises properly. These feedback devices provide uh, visual information about the accuracy of your pelvic floor muscle contractions. Real-time ultrasound is uh, one of the methods that we use that can sh uh, allow us to look at the muscles on the inside and see if your muscles are coordinating correctly. As we'll see here, we can visualize the muscles around the urethral sphincter as well as the muscles around the rectum um, contracting in a coordinated manner. We also have a surface ENG machine where electrodes are placed on your skin and they detect or they pick up electrical signals that are generated when muscles contract actively. And so we can tell a lot about how well you're able to turn on or contract your muscles and how well you're able to relax them and also how well you're able to hold and sustain a contraction. Now, just doing the pelvic floor muscle exercises uh, themselves is not enough to be able to regain continence during day-to-day -day activities. We also must remember to use those pelvic floor contractions in moments when we exert ourselves, when we cough or sneeze, when we lift a box, when we bend over, uh, when we stand up. If we don't remember and tell our muscles to contract at the appropriate times, the pelvic floor exercises themselves will not be effective. It's just as important to know what to do as it is to know when to do it. Another thing to consider is that as you practice your pelvic floor muscle exercises, there may be a time where you feel you will still experience some urinary leakage with day-to-day -day activities. And one of the main objectives of the PCSE program is to help people live their lives as best they can and as dry as they can be as they're learning to manage their urinary leakage symptoms. There are different products that are available that can sometimes be covered by extended health benefit programs. And these include absorbent products like disposable or washable pads or um, briefs, clamps, urethral inserts, uh, condom drainage devices, and anal plugs. So when we're talking about pads, which are one of the options for managing um, incontinence symptoms, it's important to know that uh, they make male and female pads and briefs, and these differ significantly. The pads that are made for males and the briefs that are made for males um, have the absorbent material up more in the front. So it's important to know when you're going out to purchase these products to specifically look for the ones that are made for men. There are also washable products 
and these are um, available for people who prefer not to use disposable products. Penile clamps can also be used to manage the symptoms of urinary incontinence, and the clamps work by compressing the urethra using any of these devices placed externally over the penis. The Cunningham clamp um, is sometimes available in local pharmacies, and the other four that are listed here are often available to be purchased online. So now in order to use a clamp, it's important that you're able to uh, follow the directions that are provided with the clamps. And specifically, we don't want to be using the clamps all day long. So you want to be able to choose the moments when you're wearing the clamp wisely. So often people will choose to wear the clamps when they're um, going out to run errands or um, doing an activity that is uh, more likely to cause leakage and then to remove the clamp um, during other times. Try to limit your wearing time with this product and follow the instructions that are included with it. Um, it's also important to know to never wear your clamp overnight um, because when you're sleeping, it's more difficult to notice if there's any discomfort or if the clamp needs to be removed or changed. We need to have normal genital sensation in order to feel if there's anything wrong uh, with the soft tissue in the area. So make sure that you're able to feel things normally before you consider using the clamp. We need to ha also have intact penile skin. And we also need to be able to feel uh, the sensation of our bladders filling. This is a really important one so that when you do feel a full bladder that you're able to um, take yourself to the bathroom, remove the clamp and uh, empty your bladder. Of course, to be able to do that, you also have to have sufficient manual dexterity in your hands to manipulate the clamps. And we also recommend that you don't use a penile clamp if you have a penile prosthesis. Uh, so one tip when using a penile clamp is when you're about to remove the clamp to empty your bladder is you want to aim the penis down into the toilet before taking it off so that any of the urine that's uh, moved into the urethra already empties into the toilet and not onto the floor or onto your pants. So the Cantino device is a medical device that's um, inserted into the urethra. It can temporarily block involuntary leakage of urine and it can be uh, removed before voiding. It's easily cleaned and then reinserted, but it has to be sized by a healthcare professional, so it's not available over the counter. And if you have more questions about that, you can contact the program or there's a website for it online. There are some physicians that prefer that patients don't use peanut clamps until they are at least one year post-op. So check with your urologist if you aren't sure. Now there isn't a lot of research pertaining to the use of peanut clamps and in terms of their risk profile, so always follow the, the directions listed on the products box. So another option for managing incontinence symptoms is to use a condom drainage device. There is an adhesive roll that is rolled onto the penis that is connected to a tube that drains the bag and collects urine that's attached to the user's leg. Once the bag is full, it can be drained using the valve on the bag and then replaced. Um, these are typically uh, low profile and can be used for day-to-day -day function. So sexual incontinence. Um, sexual incontinence is leakage with any form of sexual activity, and it can include um, thoughts or sexual arousal. Um, it can occur at any point during sexual activity. And when it occurs during orgasm, um, it's called climacteria. With sexual incontinence, it's important to know that urine uh, in or on someone's body is not harmful to the person. And so if it does occur during sexual activity, um, it's totally fine. There are many ways of managing incontinence during sexual activity. So sometimes people choose to void before uh, having sexual activity. Sometimes having a towel by the bedside to place underneath you can be helpful if the concern is getting the bed wet or having to do a lot of cleanup afterwards. Strengthening your pelvic floor muscles can certainly help with this. So often people will try uh, a very mild pelvic floor muscle contraction, about a 20% contraction during sexual activity um, to try and mitigate the symptoms of urinary leakage. Condoms can be used to help, help collect urine that leaks. They also make constrictor bands that are specifically made um, to hold back urine during sexual activity. And some, some men actually find that urinary leakage can help to substitute for the lack of ejaculation. So it replaces the sensation of not having ejaculation anymore after prostatectomy, which some people enjoy. If there are any other questions about sexual incontinence, um, feel free to also attend the sexual health module.
PCSC Physiotherapy Clinic is available to any man in BC who is 12 weeks post prostatectomy and experiencing urinary leakage. We offer each patient four complimentary one-on-one physiotherapy sessions available either in person or virtually. Radiation patients struggling with stool incontinence can also benefit from our services. Please reach out to our program coordinator to book an appointment or for further information about these services. To conclude here, bowel and bladder control can often be improved with pelvic floor physiotherapy and uh, pelvic floor muscle exercises. Each person is uh, an individual case and your symptoms may be different from other people, but don't worry because there are many different approaches that we can use to address any of the symptoms that you're feeling in terms of bowel or bladder control. Even if your urinary incontinence doesn't improve much, we want you to know that there are still many ways to manage your urinary leakage. And um, please feel free to come speak to us about um, all of your concerns. So if anything that I've spoken about today has brought up any questions, please feel free to reach out. And the contact information for the PCSE program is listed here. Um, you can see that Judy is our program coordinator and she'd be happy to help answer any questions that she can or connect you with myself and I'm happy to answer any further questions.